Okay, we're going to um, keep moving on. Our next speaker is, is John Morton, and John is extremely well known because of the, the information he's brought to our industry over many, many years, and I think the relevance of the information that he's brought to, the, to our industry has always been something that is, um, I think, a, been a, not a revelation, but it helps us form some of the decisions that are made at um, both research and at the grassroots level. So John's little brief, and this is, um, I think over the last 12 months, it's sort of, I've blanked my mind, so I've got to go back to some there about the pronunciation of epidemiology. That's it, because everybody is one at the moment. And the last 12 months, there's been that many have come out of the woodwork and have an opinion about certain aspects, not about what John does. So I have great pleasure in um, welcoming John to the platform. Yeah, so one good thing about COVID is um, I used to say to people I'm an epidemiologist and they say I was kidding, <laughs> which of course is dermatology, and, but now most people have learned, well, something about what the hell the term means. So this project um, came out of an email from Steph in about August of last year, and um, Steph and Michelle actually. An email was, now John, we're doing a lot of thinking about the national voting objective, and, and there's some really intense thinking and discussion going on. And I wonder if you can do something on the breeding value for daughter fertility. So that, that was the brief, so, so pretty, pretty open brief. But I thought, oh yeah, we, we had, we, I did some thinking and we talked to Steph and Michelle and the three of us got thinking about this. And this is what came out of it. Now, I must say, I've, I realised this morning, Steph, I've never actually asked, was this useful for the NVO discussions? Um, I was, okay. <laughs> even, if they, even if it wasn't, it's still been most interesting and important in its own right. So that's where this came from. Uh, the other collaborator, can I get this little thing going? Looks like I can't. Oh, hang on, something happened then. The other collaborator is Paul Coe. Now, a lot of people probably haven't heard that name, Paul Coe. Um, so he's at Data Gene, and he's one of these, he's a pretty humble sort of guy, but he's one of those guys that gets things done. And, and there was a fairly short timeline because the meeting for NBA was coming up quite soon. So, so poor old Paul gets his data request from me on about a Thursday. Oh, thank you. Um, and he got into it. I had to, uh, and I, essentially, I was asking for every carving from 1980 in the data gene database and a whole lot of other stuff as well. And so I distinctly remember, thank you, um, Paul's emailing as he transferred data across. And um, so I'm getting emails through Friday, Friday night. I got up Saturday morning, there's an email, 11 o'clock Friday night, last email, the rest is coming tomorrow, John. All the way through Saturday, 6 o'clock Saturday night, last email, it's come. So that's the sort of guy that Paul... Oh, where's my slides gone? Um, that's the sort of guy that Paul is, a quiet achiever, but absolutely essential for getting this thing done in time. Um, what's happening here? Oh, here we go. And the other point I want to make is, and I've got this thing working in, yep, there we go. Um, I just wanted to, I applied this framework, and how do I get that to go across there? There we go. Um, it's sort of like, it's sort of like my grandkids, you know, why? Why granddad? Right, why grandjum? So, so why do we do this? Why do we want to increase that? Well, so we increase that. Why do we want to increase that? Well, so we increase that. Because ultimately, everything matters at the herd level. For our commercial herds, it's all about herds. Why does that matter? Well, that might change that. Why does that matter? Well, that might give us some benefits that the farmer appreciates. So, so what I wanted to do was push as far along that string as I, as I could in this context. And I reckon we should be doing that. It's really the same point that Donna made. I reckon we should be doing this with all of our important breeding values, also with the index, just finding out what is what a change Say at this end, can I get that across there? Somehow. A change there, what does it do here? And, and Donna's point was, I think he's being a bit understating. I think the Irish have done more than what he was saying actually on this question. But he was saying the Australians are the only ones that are doing this. I think it's quite important. And the other critical thing about this is at this end, I reckon it's really important not to assume that the herd is the sum of the individuals. So the effect on each individual 
If you add those up, is that the effect of the herd level? I reckon often not, often not. So perhaps that's, I want to process the topic for another, another herd conference, crime. So starting off with here, here's what we, here's what we did. And I've really focused on Holsteins because that's the door to fertilities of, oh shit, oh there we are. That's, that's the daughter fertility breeding values of the cows' size. So, so I've got all the cows who were born in 1980 in the data gene database and got the size out there and looked up the most recent, it was in fact it was April, the April 2020 run for daughter fertility breeding value. And so those cows' size averaged 100 and, almost 110. And down they came, of course, as we, uh, as we now know. Um, I, I'm not focused on jerseys because the story is very, very different in jerseys. But I would make the point. I would make the point that that is a general decline down, and perhaps a smidgen steeper more recently. So I, I reckon this is, might be an issue for jerseys as well. I'm not sure what, if anything, needs to be done about that. But nevertheless, I'm focusing on Holsteins today. So that's half the story for the Holstein size. And here's the rest of the story. Just that's the same line for the size. Gee, this curse is more trouble than it's worth. <laughs> that's, that's the line for the size, coming down. So the first point about coming down is, that's what happens when you select for milk production and you forget about non-production traits. That's what happens. And when I learned that, I, th I started getting quite worried because I started thinking, well, what, <laughs> what else are we inadvertently doing in selecting for production that we don't even know about yet? Things we haven't even thought of that ultimately will decide matter. And so the, the really good thing, I noticed yesterday, for example, Almost all the discussion was about non-production traits, and that's this is the geneticists really getting a handle on this question about what else are we doing inside those inside that pool of genes that we're actually pushing along. Um, and even if we don't make progress on a lot of those non-production traits, at least someone's watching to make sure this doesn't happen to them. So that's really really good. Um, 2004, the um, the fertility breeding value went into the APR. But, but even before that, the size were not, the decline had stopped. So there was a lot of discussion going on, obviously, even before the fertility breeding value went into the APR, that this had to be stopped. Um, then about a, a flat period of about seven years, seven years, um, where the size of the cows were pretty much plateauing on average. This is all on average for the national herd, if you like. And then, of course, this very, very rapid increase, and that's, that's about 0.73 units per, um, per year. And we'll come back to, onto that in a minute. Okay, so a question for you first. How come, just looking at this decline line, how come the blue line is less than the orange line? The orange line is the dams of the cows breeding value, because I looked those up as well. How come? How come, Steph? Me on the spot. Um, why is it more steep? No, 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 that's my next question. You've, oh. you've, you've stolen my thunder. Um, how come the blue line is lower than the yellow line? Uh, because the cows are mixed age groups and so there's going to be older cows yep. in that data set? Yeah, yeah. By, well, by definition, the dam is older than the, than the daughter. And those dams, their size are from further back when they'd been when the size used to be higher. Yeah, so their size are way off the left side of the graph somewhere. That's why. Okay. Next point is next question is Steph's question. Steph's point. How come the blue line is dropping? No, no. I'll rephrase that. How come the orange line is not dropping as quick as the blue line? How come? Now, there's a couple of theories on this. First, I thought, oh, that's because the size of the dams were not dropping as far quick, as quick back then. But, and maybe that's part of it, but I reckon, I reckon it's also because there's, there's natural selection going on, if you like. The, the more fertile dams are the ones that are more likely to stay in the herd and more likely to give us a heifer calf. So we are se selectively getting our heifers out of the more fertile dams. And that's good. That's good. That means the orange line did not drop as quick as the blue line. Unfortunately, that, that effect, that natural selection, was nowhere near enough to counter the decline in the size. As you can see, that's why the orange lines come down. And so therefore, of course, the cows are on average halfway between the two. This is all Holstein, so it's, there's no heterosis here. 
And so down they come too. Now, um, and as, as soon as the sires stopped declining, in fact, as soon as the sires started rising, so did the red line, the cows. These are cows by year of birth. Yeah, so this is a whole bunch of cows born in 2010. Here's the average of their sires. Here's their average. And there's the average of their mums <coughs> up there a little bit higher. So as soon as the sires started going up, so did the cows, of course. Um, of course, not at the same rate. Look at the blue line going up, 0.73 units a day, a year. There's the cows there, about half that rate. And that's because the dams weren't going up, because we've still got the old dams with the old genes in them. So that's fine. Now moving on to the herd level. The green line is the herd. Now it should be herd inverted commas, because it's just like there's 26 million records in this data set. Um, and it's just like I pulled all those lactations to a gigantic herd. So herd inverted commas. We'll get onto real herds in a minute. So herd is here. Radio. So let me, there's herd there, running down there. Okay. Um, how come, how come the herd is higher than the cows? The green is higher than the blue until, in fact, until there. Yeah, so this is because the two-year-olds are coming in. The, the red line is the two-year-olds. So the year of birth, 20, let's pick one back here. Year of birth, 20, say five. Two years later, they come into the herd. So what's happening here is the young ones are coming in, but their genes are worse than the older cows in the herd. Yeah, so this is like reverse genetic progress. Because the size are coming down, it's, the whole thing's like upside down genetic progress. What is meant to happen is the sires are meant to be better than the dams. That means the sires, that means the cow, the daughter, is better than the mum. Yeah? But this is upside down. This is the sire is worse than the dam, so the daughter is worse than the mum. Yeah? That's what was going on. And so as a consequence, when the two-year-olds came in, every successive group of two-year-olds come in, they pull the herd down a little bit, because the two-year-olds are worse than the older cows. Upside down genetic progress. So there's the herd coming down, and the, and the final point I want to make on those dynamics is um, notice the lags. We, this is not new, of course, to, to you people, but, but noti notice the lags. The, um, the sires start improving here, but the herd only starts improving here some years later. Why is that? So why is that? It's because we don't milk two-year-olds. We milk herds of mixed-age cows. So you bring these really good two-year-olds in, but now they're trying to pull the rest of the herd average up, and there's all these old cows that are dragging them down. So hence there's lags, and of course there's lags. So the cool thing though is this, the cool thing is this, the, slope is, the slopes are all now going up. So now the next thing I did, after I went public on this next thing, actually I'll show the slide first, I did some predictions. Now, after I went public on this, I thought, geez, I must have rocks in my head to be doing predictions like this because there's so much uncertainty out there. But, but my curiosity about what fertility to expect actually trumped my caution. So curiosity won. <laughs> so still a lot of question marks, but let, let's just go with this argument for a moment and see where we end up. Let's just imagine that the sires keep going up at 0.73 per year. So that's that blue line dotted. And absolutely dotted because it's I mean, uncertainty about that. As a consequence, what we'll have, therefore, is the Y gene should work. The sires are better than the mums, so blue, blue, oh geez. blue is better than orange. Therefore, the cows, the red, are also better than their mums. That's the way genetic progress should work. And so if this keeps happening, that's the way it will work. And as a consequence, we're going to start bringing all these bunches of two-year-olds into the herd that are better than the older cows, so we're going to start shifting the herd up. Now, the reason I wanted the herd line in there, the green one, is, bec is because what drives six working calf rate from the genes point of view, it's the herd average that drives it. It's not any individual group of cows or any individual cow. So I wanted that. So it turns out, if you go with these assumptions, from 2018, which is about there, about the trough, up to 2030, that's about 6.3, oh, there it is over there, 6.3 units of increase. Right, yeah. So the next question is, what's that worth? See, I'm working my way across this. Oh, okay. I'll just be, um, 
Yeah, I'm working my way across that framework. I'm, 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 almost, I'm at the herd level now, but just because I increase herd ABV for six working calf road, does that mean anything for the farmer that's useful? Because that's what matters. That's absolutely what matters. Now that was the herd, inverted commas. This is real herds. Um, and there's two points about this. Um, the, point about, the main point about this is that there's enormous range. So that, the, the middle of those bulk boxes, that shows you the lines I was showing on the previous graph. About half the herds are in that little box there. So a lot of herds are in around 100 and, this is 2020, about 100 and, a calf was born in 2020, about 103. Um, some herds are up here, 110, and I think, I think James Mann said Molly, one of those dots in there. Um, so the story is different for individual herds because in terms of how much increase can I make, well, I reckon for James he can't make a lot more. He, in fact, he's got to be careful not to go backwards because there's a lot of sires that are worse than his cows. So that's the top end. On the other hand, there's one little dot way down there, all by itself. If, I'm not sure if that herd wants to increase fertility <laughs> through genes, but if they do, they can make a rapid improvement. They've got enormous opportunity for getting very rapid improvement. They haven't taken it so far, but it's just waiting for them to grab it if they want it. So that's real herds. Um, okay. So one, I, I'm not sure if I've run this point past you, Michelle, but I was thinking, I was thinking in terms of simplicity of reporting, and, and I was thinking gee, for people that aren't really into genetics, maybe just if I could just give them one figure for fertility genes, it'd be just the herd average figure, just one figure. So maybe uh, uh, this could fit into this somehow, Michelle. Um, they get some sort of front page which just got single figure for all the things. And if you want to pursue them, then go and have a look at this. For example, have a look at, um, at the progress report for fertility. Because I reckon this, this report is really, really cool, but it's a bit hard to get the herd average out of that. You could sort of say, well, you know, this, this example is a little bit old now, but there's my two-year-olds, there's my three-year-olds, there's my four-year-olds. So the herd average probably is somewhere in there, but we could give them a single figure. Just, just to engage those that aren't really focused on, on genes. Um, one quick, a slight tangent here. This is also real herds. This is the variation within a herd. And I used to have this sort of implicit assumption that within a herd, there's about the same spread. Like if it's James Mann's herd or Trevor's herd, about the same spread of genes, you know? But that's not true at all. That's not, not for daughter fertility, it's far from true. If you look down here, some herds have got a, a standard deviation of one. So, so what that means is, if I go plus or minus two times one, therefore if I go plus or minus two, I've got most of the cows in there. Most of the cows on daughter fertility perennial value plus or minus two. That's the bottom end. If I go to the top end, we're talking five. So I've got to go plus or minus 10 to capture most of the cows. So this is a slight tangent, but this really feeds into the genomic testing of heifers because if that herd down the bottom there, just so this is a highly hypothetical situation, but just imagine they said, now John, I'm going to genomically test the heifers. I have got a surplus of heifers and I just want to make more rapid progress on daughter fertility, protein value, that's all I care about. So it's a highly contrived scenario. If I, if I knew the standard deviation was one, I'd say don't bother because there's so little variation in your animals, just pick them randomly, it'd be nearly, nearly not much less better than what you're doing now. On the other hand, if I knew the standard deviation was five, I'd say, oh my goodness, you must have enormous range in your heifers, that's going to tell you a shitload. So the spread within a, within a herd is really, really interesting and, and I think quite important. Um, okay, so here we are, we, we cross to this level here. Next question, does that happen? Does that happen? Um, oh, this is a more recent, this is a, I did this just in the, as part of the, all this analysis, just to check this thing. This is daughter cows, daughter fertility, breeding value, again, six week in calf rate. Um, about 1.3 to 1.6% increase in six week in calf rate for every one unit increase in the cows, daughter fertility, breeding value. Now, in theory, it should be one. I've got to talk to the geneticists about why this is. Uh, um, I'd like to think that's reality and, and the 1% is not reality, but it could be off stuff top or something here. Un unquestionably, it's positive. This is the third study that's looked at this. There was that study that Donna mentioned that we looked at this for the first time. Lee Ching's done a really nice study since then um, with some Northern Victorian herds and a similar result, and this is the third one. So, so unquestionably, this fertility breeding value is working and it's a real, um, 
a real credit to the geneticist, given the crap data we give them, to generate a, a breeding value that's so good. I know they keep wanting to improve it, and I'm pleased for it to be improved too. Okay, so, so now we get onto this predictive rocks in the head stuff. Um, because if you take that 6.3 we saw in that, for the herd, in that earlier graph, multiply by 1.3, I get 8. Yeah? 8. So, I'm not sure where I'm going on this with slides. Okay, I'll just go back. Now, so is, the 8%, is that 8% really going to happen? Well, I was fairly happy about that. So there's, a, there's a few crucial assumptions. One assumption, of course, is that the size will keep going up at this rate, 0.73. Now, I don't know, you guys probably know more than that about me as to whether that's going to keep happening. Um, of course, the other issue is Beth's presentation from yesterday where one thing she said, she talked about inbreeding, inbreeding in Holsteins and Jerseys, and she said the effects are bigger on survival and fertility than on milk production. So then I realised um, that 8%, maybe we're not going to get 8% because of inbreeding. So one thing I'd really like to know is how much we're not going to get. Because one thing Trevor said in that discussion yesterday was just give us a bit of a hint as to how big this effect is, you know, the inbreeding, the inbreeding cost, if you like. How big is this problem, um, and therefore how much do we, how much effort do we go into solve it? So therefore, eight percent probably is too high. We have had some discussions this morning, and I reckon there's some pretty quick and simple ways we could get a handle on on how much that inbreeding effect might be, Steve. So we should, we should pursue that. Um, so here we are over here. I'm not going to go to the next step because that's probably beyond the scope of this talk. So therefore, I'm just going to summarise. And summarising, uh, that's that first point. Um, non-production traits. So to me, this is totally in hand now because there's this massive focus on non-production traits, and I reckon our, our geneticists are doing a great job here. Second point is that that ABV is working well. It, it's quite amazing to me, but it's so cool. Two questions there. Two question marks in front of the eight percent. You could add one more for now. I know about inbreeding and the possible amount we're not going to get because of inbreeding. Um, Fourth conclusion, those low ABV herds, that is low daughter fertility ABV herds, they can go rap more rapid than that if they want to. Um, younger herds, not, not that I'm advocating high replacement rate herds, not, not by a long shot, in fact, on the, other, on the contrary, I'd advocate the other. But if a herd is young, they can go more rapidly too. If, they, if they're staying young and not, and not increasing in herd size, um, they can go rapidly too. Um, and the final point is, oh, that thing about just applying this same sort of framework to the, the other production ABVs and perhaps to the index as well, just to find out what th they do at the herd level. Um, thanks, Graham. And John, um, thanks very much. There's a question on Slido I'll just have a look at. Will the herd six weeks and calf rate be influenced by the herd, the herd age structure? Is a younger herd will have a better six week in calf rate? Uh, yeah, um, definitely age structure matters. Absolutely, age structure matters. Um, peak fertility is about four, five year olds. Um, the young ones are not quite as good as that. I suspect if we grew our heifers better, the young ones would be nearly as good as the middle aged cows. There's a decline with age, and, and I don't know if we're going to ever solve that. I, I don't think we're going to stop it. Um, so yes, that's true. Um, I'm trying to work out the context of that question. Um, a younger herd will have a better six-week calf rate. Yes, absolutely. A younger herd will have a better six-week calf rate, all else equal. But I'm arguing essentially for an old, a slightly older herd, um, therefore um, slightly um, um, lower replacement rate, therefore less replacement costs. But but a herd that's got high ABV daughter fertility and, and doing a whole bunch of other things right too. So. I think, that's, I think that might be the context of the question. So there's one here, Graham. Yep. Um, what ABVs are used for the analysis? Could the phenotypic increase rates be due to heterosis, which isn't captured in the ABVs? Okay, so what ABVs are used? So all daughter fertility ABVs of the sires, the cows, the dams, um, and they were the April 2020 run, because back then we are just doing annual runs, of course. Um, could the phenotypic rates be, in, be due to heterosis? Well, every animal in the data set was, the breed code was FFFF, and furthermore, there's a new field in, in the uh, 202 file now, which is breed used for genetic analyses, and that, that was F as well. So 
I, I know, I know the breed classifications are not perfect, and there'll be some, there'll be a little bit juice. It's snuck into my data set. I would hope it's not too big. I would hope maybe there's more people, people know more about this than me. How many of those FFFs have got a little bit of jersey and that no one told me about? John, just another question. You know, you mentioned about the impact of selection for milk on fertility, and we saw those numbers, and I think you termed it as, um, what was it, upside down genetic progress? <laughs> and it's very much a fertility work you've done. What are the other consequences that, you know, you did briefly mention it, that because of that extreme now selection for fertility, and you mentioned James, the situation about no change, is there another unexpected consequence of an upside down genetic progress for other traits because of that huge focus on fertility? Uh, oh yeah, I, I don't know enough about this, Graham, but, but absolutely, that's, that's why I'm really pleased that there's such a strong focus on non-production traits. It doesn't always, I was thinking when I was running the other day, it, it isn't always negative because I reckon there'll be some traits out there that are positively associated, positively correlated with, with um, milk production that we don't even know about, that we value, that we're getting for free. We, we don't even know we're doing it. Fertility is the opposite, of course, negative correlation. So we went for milk production and, and as it, it cost us infertility. So the question becomes then, let's think hard about the other traits that we really do value in cows and make sure that we get breeding values for them. Which is not to say we've thought of everything, of course. We never, we never thought of everything. <laughs> is that what? Yeah, no, just out of interest, I think it's a, yeah. So I think unless there's any more questions, Eric, do you want to grab a mic? It just works better from a, um, a perspective of streaming. Um, I was just wondering, uh, when a farmer's looking at BPIs and looking at size on paper and trying to go forward and fertility is such a big trait, it looks to me like the average is, is 105. Uh, on BPI, when you're looking up a site, it, is, it looks like the average there is 105, but it's expressed as 100 as average on BPI. I'm just wondering, should that, shouldn't that come back five points that the average is actually 100? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you're actually going backwards if you're using a bull that's uh, 105 or less for fertility. Yeah. Um, okay? So, unless you're working off a 10-year-old base or something. Yeah, so this was all April 2020 run, and the base has not been changed since... Who's someone who knows this? The base has not been changed since then, has it? No. So it's all in that, on that base. The, the April... Whatever was used in April 2020, it's still the same base. So that is that. Yeah. It must be a very old base. It, it must be a very old base because the average is actually 105 now. But it's and still yet... the current base, isn't it? So, the, so well, the, the, the run this week would have used the same base as that. Okay. Yeah, is that right? Oh, someone needs to tell me this. Yes. No, the base yes. hasn't changed. There's no. There hadn't been a roll of the base. So, but, so let me quickly get that slide up with the graph on. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, that's it. The average, uh, the average of the size. That's what I want. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm taking too long here. So this is so the most recent. This is ca by, by cows day, year of birth. So this is 2018. That's the last year of birth I had. I had a few 2019 calvings, but not enough. So yeah, the average 100 and, 104. So that's cows born in 20. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, cows born in 2018. The average of their size. Yeah. Does that seem sensible? Uh, yes. Well, I'm just looking at your, your blue line down below, right? I am. And for tracking the sire line. The blue, you, I, I would assume looking at an line. ABV, if I look at an ABV today, I'd say, oh, 100's average, but it's not. Uh, 105 is actually average. Uh, yes, absolutely. For, yeah. for cows born in 2018, 105 is average. Absolutely. Yep. So your point is, therefore, you don't want size that are less than 105. Yeah, I, yeah, I totally agree. Okay. Well, I'll have to um, leave there. Thanks again, John. And as normal, uh, always has discussion, and I'm sure there'll be some discussion still to come, but it's a really important work. Thank you.